There has long been a debate whether or not someone can be born evil. Are children innocent from birth and just get tainted by society or the circumstances of their upbringing? Or are some just born bad? Do they have the urge to hurt others from the moment they can think clearly? Nathaniel Barjona was born as David Paul Brown on February the 15th, 1957 in Worcester, Massachusetts. He, as you may have noticed, changed his name, but we'll get to that in a bit. Right from the get-go, it became clear that something just wasn't right with Jonah. When he was only seven years old, he managed to lure a five-year-old girl from the neighborhood into his basement. He had promised to show her the Ouija board that he had gotten for his birthday. Once in the basement, he tried to strangulate the girl. But thankfully, his mother heard her desperate screams and she managed to get him off of her. Now this could have been a turning point at which Nathaniel could have gotten help or at least be put into an institution where he and society would be kept safe from him and his urges. But nothing came from this incident. And seeing as no police report was ever filed, the parents of the girl either never found out about what happened or Nathaniel's mother talked him out of finding one, probably playing it off as child's play gone wrong. This, as it would later turn out, would be fatal for a lot of children to come. In 1970, Jonah was only 13 at the time, he managed to convince another child from the neighborhood to go out with him. This time, it was a six-year-old boy. Jonah told him they would go for a sleigh ride on a secluded hill. But once there, Jonah essayed the boy. Again, nothing came of this incident and Nathaniel would walk free again. During his senior year in high school, Jonah would figure out a technique to lure his victims in. He pretended to be a police officer. This technique he would use for years to come. In 1975, Jonah used this exact tactic to get an eight-year-old boy who was on his way to school into his car. There he essayed the boy and then strangulated him. Luckily for the boy, a neighbor saw him getting abducted and called the police. When they found him, the boy was barely conscious. Jonah though only got one year of probation for the crime. One of the many times the justice system failed Jonah's victims. Only a few days before he graduated high school, he used the same tactic, pretending to be a police officer, again. This time to lure a nine-year-old girl into his car. He only let go of her when she started to throw up and convulse. Even though a witness saw his car and told the police his license plate, the incident was never reported to his local police department or his probation officer. So in 1976, Jonah was released from probation. On the 24th of September 1977, Jonah again, pretending to be an officer, snatched two boys from a movie theater. He drove them to a secluded area and handcuffed both of them. He threw one of the children into the trunk of his car and dragged the other one into the woods. Jonah at this point weighed around 375 pounds and he tried to use his weight to suffocate the boy. Now this incredibly brave child pretended to be dead and so managed to get Jonah to let go of him. Once Jonah had disappeared, the boy ran into the town and the nearest police station and alerted the authorities who managed to find Jonah and rescue the other boy. Nathaniel was charged and sentenced to between 18 and 22 years in prison. And this is where this story should end. But unfortunately it doesn't. As I said, the justice system failed many times in this case. After talking to a psychiatrist about his sick urges, some of which included cannibalism, he got transferred to the Bridgewater State Hospital. It was around that time that he changed his name from David Paul Brown to Nathaniel Bar Jonah. His explanation for the name change varied from trying to honor his Jewish roots to wanting to feel what it was like to be a discriminated Jew. Although Jonah never made a secret about his sexual urges towards children, he got released in July of 1991. A judge deemed him no danger to society and released him. Psychological care was recommended. It only took a month after his release for Jonah to strike again. He saw a boy waiting in a car outside a post office. He got into the car and sat on the boy to try and suffocate him. When other people saw this, they of course alerted the police. And even though Jonah tried to flee, he actually got arrested by the same officer that had arrested him 15 years before. Jonah first claimed that he didn't see the boy and just got into the car to ask for a ride, but he later admitted he did in fact want to kill the child. Jonah got off again with two years of probation and he had to move with his mother to Great Falls, Montana. And he had to promise to never return to Massachusetts again. And somehow, no one in Massachusetts deemed it necessary to contact Jonah's probation officer in Montana. So they didn't even know about what he had done in Massachusetts. Because no one knew about his previous crimes, Nathaniel managed to blend in seamlessly into the local community. So seamlessly that he even got hired 
as a babysitter. In December of 1993, he got charged with trying to molest an eight-year-old boy that he had been babysitting. His defense was that he didn't do it because if he did, the boy wouldn't be alive anymore. His lawyer got the case dropped because his rights to a speedy trial got violated. On February the 10th of 1996, 10-year-old Zachary Ramsey disappeared on his way to school. Witnesses would later say they saw Zachary crying after he had nearly been run over by a white car and that an obese man had been following him. And even though Nathaniel's mother had a white car that fit the description and Jonah had the exact same clothes that witnesses described seeing the man that followed Zachary wear, he was never charged with Zachary's disappearance. Detective Bill Belusky was the one on the case at the time and even though he couldn't charge Jonah with the crime, he never let go of his suspicion that he was the one that killed Zachary. Sometimes after Zachary's disappearance, Jonah moved out of his mother's house and into an apartment complex. In this apartment, Jonah would continue lure young boys and essay them, even going as far as installing a pulley on his ceiling where he hung at least one of the boys by the neck. And even though some of the parents noticed that their children's behavior changed after they went to Jonah, none of them thought anyone in Great Falls would hurt a child or even murder it. Nathaniel's neighbors would later recount something very chilling though. Something that was made even more horrific by a fine the police would later make. They said when Jonah hosted barbecues, he served them meat. Meat that tasted very strange. Jonah would claim it was deer he had hunted, but none of them had ever seen him go hunting. He didn't even own a gun. And none described the meat as tasting like deer. In 1999, Detective Belusky and a local attorney general charged Jonah with impersonating a police officer after he had been seen outside a local elementary school. This served two purposes. First of all, Jonah would be kept off the streets and away from children for a while, but even more important, it got them search warrants for Jonah's apartment and his mother's house. At first, these warrants were just four objects that could be used to impersonate a cop, but they got a second one that allowed them to search for photographs and documents. And what they would find would horrify even the most seasoned officers. They found, obviously, a lot of things used to impersonate a police officer, like badges, toy guns, and items of clothing. They found two albums with cutouts of children and documents about bondage and autoerotic asphyxia. They found lists with boys' names, some even from Jonah's childhood in Massachusetts, including some that the police knew he had molested. On one of the lists was also the name Zachary Ramsey. Next to his name was only one word died. They found 3,500 pictures of children and multiple news clippings about Zachary's disappearance. Next to that, they found undeveloped films with pictures of Jonah and three not identified young boys. I don't think I have to tell you what Jonah was doing to them in those pictures. And even though most of those things are horrifying, what they found then would make Jonah notorious. They found a book written in code. After they cracked that code, they figured out that it was a cookbook, but not just any cookbook. A cookbook using children as ingredients. In it were recipes for little boy pot pie, French fried kit, and little boy stew just to name a few. But the book wasn't the only thing they found. In Jonah's garage, they discovered a piece of stained plywood. It had been scrubbed with bleach, but the bleach hadn't removed the marks of a meat cleaver that were on it. I told you before about his neighbors talking about the strange meat at the barbecue he had served them. This barbecue was right after Zachary had disappeared. Nonetheless, even though they couldn't find any of Zachary's remains, the police were sure that Jonah had killed him and done unspeakable things to his body. Now, very sadly, Jonah would never be charged for Zachary murder. And the reason for that might surprise you. It was Zachary's mother. She steadfast refused to believe that her son was dead. Apparently a psychic had convinced her that he was living in Italy. She even went so far as to say that should they trial Jonah with the murder of her son, she would go to court and defend him. And I know she got judged heavily by the people around her for that. I feel pity for her. I think any parent would rather imagine that their child was living happily in Italy rather than having been killed and eaten. As I said, Jonah wouldn't be charged with Zachary's disappearance, but he was put on trial for the molestation of the other children. In 2002, he was sentenced to 130 years in prison without the chance of parole. His charges were essay, 
aggravated kidnapping and assault with a deadly weapon. Jonah would only serve a few years of his sentence. On April the 13th in 2008, he was found dead in his cell. He had died from a heart attack caused by his massive obesity. In 2011, Zachary's dad had him legally declared dead against the will of his mother, who to this day still hasn't given up hope that her son will return to her. We don't know how many children Nathaniel Bar Jonah has killed or molested, but to this day he is still the suspect in many missing children cases. Unfortunately with his dad, he also took any kind of information. He never admitted to any killings and he was unwilling to talk to detectives for the duration of his time in prison. This case was probably one of the worst ones I ever had to read up on. And there were many times where I heavily debated even making this video. But so many children got failed so many times in this case mostly by the law that was supposed to protect them. There was no reason to let Jonah out of prison or even ever give him probation. And I think these failings should be made as public as possible. I hope to see you guys again in my next video. Until then, please stay safe and let me know your thoughts in the comments down below.